Happy Valentine's Day weekend to you all, and this week I had the pleasure, or mispleasure, or however you're going to read these reviews, I had the pleasure and displeasure of watching three different movies, Happy Death Day to You, Alita Battle Angel, and Isn't It Romantic. So let's start with... I'm going to pledge Kappa now that we have a death curse. If it's one thing I can commend Blumhouse Productions on, it's the amount of movies that Jason Blum can actually produce. I mean, people seem to think that the MCU is already oversaturated the market because they release three movies a year. But if you take a look at Jason Blum's own production career, well, in the last year, in 2018, he produced 21 movies and television products. I'm not shitting you. If you look on his IMDb page, he's done 21 movies and television products in 2018 alone. And with Happy Death Day to you, it marks his fifth of this year alone. That is some incredible shit. And the fact that he could produce so many concepts and products in one year is a testament to how dedicated to the craft of filmmaking he really is. Granted, this style of producing can be a bit overcomplicated and can produce products that are not exactly the most well-produced, considering that his line of reasoning is well-stretched thin, as opposed to people like Kevin Feige, who has proven to be the sixth successful uh, producer in Hollywood in terms of how to produce movies and television, since he is only, do he is only doing three movies a year at this point and all of them tend to do really really well both critically and financially so does this line of reasoning that because of jason blum's over overcompensation for producing does that sort of over, over uh, overcompensation produce a less than stellar product well let's take a look at happy death day to you shall we Happy Death Day to You takes place a day after the event of the first film as Ryan, played by Fee Vu, starts to experience the same things Tree, played by Jessica Roth. Um, when Ryan brings this up to her, she must once again confront the baby-faced killer and hopefully put an end to the terror once and for all. But there is a slight twist to this as through certain events she is whisked back to the previous day and has to try to get her back and has to try to get herself back to her own reality. But another twist arises as certain small things that have changed about her day seem to go noticed that she has to then navigate through. If it's one thing that might deter some people from this sequel, it's the fact that, well, it's not exactly the best advertised movie. The movie is advertised as a horror film, a horror slasher film. When in actuality, upon watching the film, it's more of a sci-fi film with small horror elements and a lot of comedy. And this is probably one of my biggest flaws with the film, is that it's a complete genre whiplash from the first one. I had the pleasure of watching the first one before actually going to see the second. And I gotta tell you, I kind of enjoyed that one. Now, granted, it's not the most original concept in the world. It's basically Groundhog's Day mixed with some slasher elements. It's all right to me. But the thing is, is that a lot of the sort of looping back is very ambiguous. You don't really get an answer to what it is that was actually causing it. And the writer of that film actually writes this one as well, uh, The Happy Death Day to You. And he explains that this is all a product of some sort of a science experiment that is try that is continually looping a certain day because of well a failed mathematical algorithm. Yeah, this is a very different type of movie that will have some fans of the of the first one just kind of scratching their heads and saying, "So this whole thing is now a Back to the Future parody." I mean, granted, the whole concept of the first one, at, I mean, at the very end, they kind of mention Back to the Future. Thus, it kind of leads into this one, but it's kind of different. And what's also kind of upsetting about this film in terms of uh, what it does is that it promotes itself as a slasher film, but the slasher element, the whole mystery of who the babyface killer really is, is kind of just sidestepped. 
you know? It's not necessarily there. No one's trying to figure out who the killer really is. I mean, yeah, they'll they'll kind of point at it a couple times, but uh, no, actually not. It there, There's nothing like that at all. And it's just... It's just not there. Uh, and the thing... And the thing is, is that even with the reveal at the very end of who the babyface killer is, there's no real build-up to it. And granted, I wasn't necessarily too surprised. But when it came down to it, I just kind of felt that the whole killer angle to this whole thing just feel, felt very superfluous to the entire experience. Because as you slowly find out in the entire film, it's mostly about Jessica Ross Tree trying to decide between two different worlds. Does she want a world? Does she want to go back to her world where she doesn't have a have a mother, but she has her boyfriend, or does she wants to stay in the world that she is in now, where she has her mother back, and well, you know, doesn't really have anything much else. Uh, and I and I thought that is a really good dilemma. It's not the most well thought out one, but I think in terms of of a Tree as a character, she actually has some good, you know, moral dilemmas here, you know, and it kept challenging her every step of the way. Uh, I, always, I also found Jessica Roth's tree to be the best part about this movie. In fact, in both of these movies, both Happy Death Day and Happy Death Day to You, Jessica Roth brings a really exciting character. Like, again, she's not a Bill Murray, right, from Groundhog's Day. But her situation, every time she gets up, you know, it's always sort of hilarious and fun. And they really kind of amp up the different ways that Tree decides to uh, die in this movie, which was kind of hilarious at some points uh, with a skydiving section that you kind of see in the trailer. Uh, but it was, <laughs> it's actually quite hilarious at times, um, even during the montage where she has to um, go to this, uh, this sort of place to memorize a certain thing. Uh, so that she can narrow down a certain thing to help her get back home. You know, I felt like that that whole montage sequence played to Paramore's hard, tar hard times was actually kind of hilarious. Every time, every time she died, I'm just like, this is kind of hilarious. It's kind of fun. And the whole movie kind of plays out like that. It's a self-aware, it's kind of self-aware in the sense that you know you're getting yourself into this whole, oh yeah, you know, we're, we're just going to keep killing her every time. Just have some fun with it. And that's kind of what Happy Death Day to You really is. It's a, it's a film where Tree just keeps re repeatedly dying. Uh, but that's not necessarily the only thing, you know. I, I really liked a lot of the elements, you know. I liked, you know, again, I liked Tree. I liked her moral dilemma. I liked um, some of the more heartwarming sections of the film. Uh, it's very funny. Um, but there is one thing... Um, that some people kind of get confused on is the mid credit scene. And yes, there is a mid credit scene. Is that the film itself has this mid credit scene and supposedly, quote unquote, it teases a third movie. But to me, I don't really see it that, that way. If you've seen the mid credit scene of this film, you'll kind of realize that it's not exactly pointing at a third movie. It was just kind of a scene where it just kind of was like, yeah, this character gets gets their just desserts, you know. It's it's just played for laughs, really. But if it does come out to be another third installment, I'd be kind of interested to see what they do with it. Uh, but I'm not entirely the most, you know, situated to be with, with that whole ordeal. And I also appreciated the sort of bait and switch that we kind of get with this movie where it kind of it starts off with Ryan and you kind of think it's going to rehash a lot of the stuff that happened in the first Happy Death Day where they have to keep dying to try to figure out who the killer is. I kind of like this aspect. Um, but then it just transitions to Tree as, as the main character. And granted, while it does have a sort of repetition to it, uh, it doesn't quite follow the same formula as the first Happy Death Day I found um, after the fact. Um... I'm, I actually enjoyed Happy Death Day to you. It's not necessarily the most well-written. It's not necessarily as good or even as, you know, standard as the original. But I did find it a little bit more enjoyable than the first one. Uh, simply because it just balances some new ideas into the whole horror slasher genre. Um, but at the same time, it just kind of costs itself from, you know 
its own genre. You know, it costs its genre label as a horror movie, but it switches it up to more of a sci-fi comedy, which is kind of what it is. And they kind of, they false advertised it. That's all I got to say. If they falsely advertised the film. Um, but even with that said, I still enjoyed certain aspects of this film. It's not the most well done thing that Jason Blum has done as a producer. Um, but happy death day to you for me, at least gets a C plus. Good morning, beautiful. Last night was amazing. Natalie, I love So yesterday, I'm recording this February 15th, yesterday was Valentine's Day, and I'm sure most of you stayed home to watch some good romantic comedies, or even some bad ones. I, I watched Titanic and some other films, but I also viewed Isn't It Romantic, um, and the trailer would have you believe that it's a sort of uh, satirical takedown of, of romantic comedies. And while at times it does this, it's just not as good as I thought it was going to be. Uh, the film follows Natalie, played by Rebel Wilson, as she grew up believing rom-coms are shams when she bonks her head via a rejected Amy Schumer movie idea and wakes up in a rom-com world full of odd coincidences and it's up to her to find out how to escape from this world while also finding love. There is a point that I find in comedies between being satirical while working as their own genre. Films like Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz do the same things. They are within their genre, but they also kind of like to poke fun at it while also not being the most, you know, the, the, well, not being the same thing. Um, and the thing with this movie is that it just doesn't do it. It tries to have its cake and eat it too, and that's kind of the unfortunate thing with this movie, is that while it does poke fun at the romantic comedy sort of tro tropes and, you know, cliches of the genre, it just kind of falls back into it, right? Um, and here's a good example of, of how you should subvert the sort of expectations of, of a genre trope, right? One of the genre tropes in superhero films is to uh, let go of, of the villain and put him in jail, you know, and not kill him. In Deadpool, however, you, let's take a look at this scene. Any last words? What's my name? Who fucking cares? Wait! Four or five moments. I'm sorry? Four or five moments, that's all it takes. To... Be a hero. Ugh. Everyone thinks it's a full-time job. Wake up a hero, brush your teeth a hero, go to work a hero. Not true. Over a lifetime, there are only four or five moments that really matter. Moments when you're offered a choice. To make a sacrifice, conquer a flaw. Save a friend, spare an enemy. In these moments, everything else falls away. The way the world sees us. The way we... That scene, in of itself, is a, a genre subversion, right? Not only does it work as a great comedic point for the film, but it's also kind of a critical point against, you know, the PG-13 uh, superhero movies where they tend to kind of, like, put all the villains back in jail. They do all that stuff. Um, and I think <laughs> I think that that was a pretty good thing. But Isn't It Romantic just doesn't do any of that, for me at least. Isn't It Romantic tries to but fails as it follows a pretty conventional narrative at the same time. I found Rebel Wilson as a character to be an okay presence. She's not one of my favorite actresses, but if you're going to do a sort of subversion of the romantic comedy with, uh, with a different type of actress, I think she does a pretty decent job, honestly. Um, and the thing, but the thing is that um, there, there's really nothing that kind of subverts the tropes that are being made fun of in the film. Um, I also found her kind of annoying at the beginning, just like there's this whole five minute section where, or not even five minutes, it's like two and a half, and she keeps going on and on and on about all these tropes and rom-coms, and I'm just sitting there in the theater grasping my head, 
just going, shut up, okay? I We understand that she grows up to, to have this disdain towards romantic comedies. But we don't need a two and a half minute segment where she goes through every single trope in romantic comedies. You know, you could easily, easily make fun of these things with just a much more smarter and, and tightly scripted thing. You know, you don't even need to point out the tropes. Just go through the tropes and just subvert them. That's, that's something that, like, Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz do better. They play through the type of movie that you would expect. But, through the progression of that movie, they subvert the expectations with funnier, more comedic takes on these certain tropes. And that's why, you know, those types of films are funny. But here, Isn't It Romantic just doesn't do anything with it. Like, all it is is just a person going through this romantic comedy world. And all it does is, oh yeah, th that's not cool. Oh yeah, that's disgusting. I don't like that. I mean, granted, Rebel Wilson doesn't actually go through like that. But you get my, you get my drift here. It's like, it doesn't try to have fun with, with making fun of the romantic comedy. Because anyone can make fun of a, of a sappy romantic comedy that isn't entirely well written. You can easily do it. That's so easy. And it's so, there's so many missed opportunities I found in this film. Um, with, with the types of jokes that they try to do. Like, there's a couple smart jokes in here. Uh, one with the, the, the flower petals and the whole, oh yeah, if you take all these flower petals, throw them up in the air, it'll create the perfect number. Like, what if, what if instead of that, she does that same thing, but it doesn't do, do that? What if it, it just spreads out to just a random number, and she calls it, and it's just some other person that she doesn't know about, right? What if, that would be a funny joke. That would be a funny subversion of, of that trope. But no, it keeps falling back into the same tropes of a romantic comedy. And it, it just kind of makes me sad because the trailer would have you believe it's a, it's a full-on satire of, this, uh, of the romantic comedy genre. And it doesn't do it. It doesn't do it any justice. And I feel like there was a lot of missed opportunities with this. Uh, there's also a couple of odd editing choices. Uh, there's one in the subway around halfway through the film where there's a lot of these like zoom in shots. Like they didn't zoom in with the camera. They just went in, you know, in post credits and did this. They did a lot of that in that, in that film, that whole little section there. Um, there's even a lot of cuts in uh, the first time we see Rebel Wilson waking up in the morning. You know, a lot of these cuts these random cuts and i'm just like why is it edited that way it just kind of breaks from the immersion of the scene like i understand you're trying to establish the the world that she lives in but we can already tell it through the color grading of the scene you don't need to have all these different establishing shots of all the different things in her apartment just show us living have her show show us her living in her world you know just you know, have have that different grayscale. You know, have the different color correction. That cues us in naturally as an audience that this is just the real world, and she's living in the real world. And through the progression of the film, her world view gets colorized, gets brightened. Pleasant Phil did this stuff, and Pleasantville's not even that great of a movie. The ending as well didn't do the film any favors, as the ending is also emblematic of the issue with the film, which is trying to have your cake and eat it too. The film ends with the character having everything that a rom-com espouses that you would have at the end of a film. And you would think the ending itself would try to sub have a funny take, on the sub funny take on that ending, but no, it just doesn't. It just falls into the same sort of romantic comedy trap of like, oh yeah, we need this big musical number at the end because it's funny. But it isn't. It just didn't fall into the funny category. I understand that comedy is subjective, but the comedy here isn't even well done, as I pointed out. Uh, no one in my audience laughed once, and in the end, I would probably say that you should watch something else this Valentine's Day weekend. Uh, stay home. Watch Say Anything or The Before Trilogy. Both of these are better recommendations than Isn't It Romantic. Uh, and one other thing, too, I found with this film, I'm kind of tired of seeing New York 
I've seen so many films in the past couple years where the place where the film takes place is New York City. I'm tired of it. <laughs> it's everywhere. Of course, I can understand it in the Marvel Cinematic Universe since, you know, Stan Lee was from Manhattan. But the thing is, is like I've seen it in so many other movies. I'm just tired of seeing it. I kind of want a bit more diversity in where we see our films in terms of location. Uh, that's that's something I, I, I wanted to say before I gave my my score. And I'm going to give Isn't It Romantic a D+. Plus. And last but not least is Alita Battle Angel, a movie that had been pushed from December to February that had a lot of people thinking that it was terrible. But I gotta say, it's not as bad as you think it is. And it's really good. As I had made it, as I had made it all the more apparent the other day with my Titanic video, I love James Cameron. And his work. Not all of his stuff is great, but he is a very technical director who manages to make whole movies utilizing big budgets. But what actually happens when you pair that with a director who mostly works with low budget movies such as Spy Kids, Shark Boy and Lava Girl, and even From Dust Till Dawn? You get a movie like Alita Battle Angel, and it is something to see in the theater. Uh, based on the manga of the same name, Alita takes place in the 26th century where we follow Dr. Ido, played by Christoph Waltz, as he discovers a discarded cyborg whom he fixes and names Alita. She is played by Rosa Salazar and she is trying to remember who she really is, finding that the more she fights, the more she remembers. But there are other forces at play as Mahosha Ali plays Vector, who aims to take her down. First and foremost, I need to clarify something. I need to give huge props to Weta Workshop, which, if you don't know, has done a lot of really great suit work, CGI, and practical effects for some of the many films that you may not have known of, or may have, who knows. They've done work on Avatar, they did work on Ghost in a Shell, Adventures of Tintin, District 9, and a lot of other films, including this one. And I gotta say, the CG work in this film, the, the amount of detail that's on Alita's first body is so intricate. The design work that's in her her armor not only reflects the type of, you know, angel character she is, because she did fall from, you know, grace, uh, but the thing is, is that the design work that's put into it, it's also very much like Robert Rodriguez's own, you know, stylings. Since he is known for doing a lot of Hispanic, you know, action, grindhouse films, prior to doing, you know, Spy Kids and all that, it really reflects the influence of his Hispanic heritage. Uh, in fact, a lot of the environments in this film, uh, some of the textiles too, is very much influenced from, uh, partially influenced from his own upbringing as a Hispanic director. And I truly appreciate a lot of these little details. There's even whole buildings that remind me of, of things from um, Barcelona and a, a lot of other different Hispanic cities. Um, that I've seen pictures of. I've never been there. I kind of want to go to Barcelona one time, but that's that's neither here nor there. <laughs> neither here nor there. Um, to my understanding, this is also the first time that Roder Robert Rodriguez has also balanced a hundred million dollar plus film, and for what he does, he utilizes it pretty decently. Uh, I feel like most of the budget went into the CG and practical effects that they did for the film. Uh, and it looks pretty amazing. Uh, the cinematography works pretty too, especially in the rollerball or the, the death ball sequences where the action is very, very close together. It, you know, it makes you feel like you're part of the action of the, of the high speed sort of skate ball sort of thing. I really enjoyed those segments. In fact, a lot of the action sequences too, they can be pretty fun. I wish there was more though of like wider shots where we see a lot of the a lot of the chaos that's that's in in engrossing in the film, uh, but aside from that, the action was kind of fun to watch, uh, especially with Alita fighting these larger than life characters. I thought that was kind of fun too, um, but 
if there's one thing I have to say that you should not do with this film is watch it in 3D. I came back home after watching Alita Battle Angel. I had a migraine in my in my left eye and I felt sick and I could I, I didn't want to do anything. I slept in my bed for like an hour trying to trying to trying to sleep it off. And this has never happened to me before with the 3D where, you know, I can sit through a 3D movie and be fine with it. But after this one, I was I was a little bit more sick this time around. So if it's one thing I can recommend to you guys is not seeing this film in 3D. That's the one thing I don't want you guys to do. Uh, as far as adaptations go, I've never read the manga. So I'm not going to be judging this, this film on adaptation points. But for what I want to say is that there's a lot of really interesting stuff that they point out in this film that I'll probably get, you know, expanded upon in the sequel. Uh, I like the concept of the whole uh, hunter-warrior aspect. I liked Rosa Salazar as Alita. She brings a little bit more heart and humanity. You know, at first she's a little bit, you know, naive, you know, um, trying to figure out who she is. It's really interesting to watch, and there's a little bit more um, heart in this one, uh, especially with Christoph Waltz's character and his backstory. And while it is a little bit cliche for some of the genre tropes of, of what they're doing here, I found it kind of, you know, relatable, I guess. Uh, Christoph Waltz does a pretty decent job, and while in other movies he could be wasted, here he's not, not so much. Um, it... It isn't a masterpiece, I should say, um, or anything like that, but it is a decent popcorn film. It's a film that you could sit back, relax, sit and watch the movie. It's it's really fun. It's, ener it's energizing. The acting is pretty decent for most of the actors, and the dialogue at times can be a little bit off. I still find it a, is very fun to watch. Um... As far as I also know, this is James Cameron's passion project for, like, years. And he wanted to get Robert Rodriguez for the movie, and he did it. He did it. Um, but, yeah, overall, it's a very fun, fun film. It's not great. You know, it's not a great film. A great film is kind of like something like Upgrade, where I could recommend it. It's, like, a fun, but it's also very smart. Um, and the film has some not-so-subtle uh, references to the themes of heaven and hell, religion, uh, the economic divides, uh, but it still works for what it's trying to do. Uh, and it even has a surprise cameo by Edward Norton, who plays this very shadowy figure in the background of the film, who we don't really get a line of dialogue with, which is probably just setting up for a sequel. Um, I also found the film quite violent, as there are body parts that are literally just cut clean off there's even a human who gets like chopped in half in this film and this is a pg-13 movie very fun it, it's a fun film i'll say that it's a very fun film i had an enjoyable time with it despite the 3d which is not going to lower my grade at all for the film but i just fi found it fun not entirely the most relatable but it's very engaging the effects are really great as 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 always with weta works um and that's all I really have to say about this film. Um, and if they actually ever do a sequel, I'm fully behind Alita uh, taking on the bad guy. I would love to see what happens next with this. Uh, maybe I should read the manga after reading this, uh, after watching this movie. Uh, that's what I'll do. And so I'm going to give Alita Battle Angel a B-. Uh, and that's a score just, just for now. Uh, that might change over time as I read the manga series. We'll see what it does, but apparently some people are really enjoying it. Some people are saying it's the best anime movie of all time, but who knows? Who knows? Um, can't wait to see what's next for James Cameron, and I hope to see you guys next week in another video. Peace.